last but not least, Ben Jackson, who's an MD PhD candidate in Lydia Finley's group at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre. Yeah, thank you so much um, for, for having me here to share my work. I'm excited to, to talk, with, talk with you all and follow up on two such interesting uh, presentations before. Um, so broadly in the Finney lab, we're, we're a cell biology lab where they're interested in the changes that occur as a cell transitions from, from one state to another, for example, from a pluripotent stem cell to a more, more differentiated cell type. And I think, as you all appreciate, there are many ways to really understand or quantify cell state transitions, for example, changes in gene expression or downstream changes on translation, proteome or modeling. Um, but the lens that we tend to really view these transitions through is, is metabolism. Um, and now we and many others have shown that different cells have different metabolic profiles. And we think of these profiles as being sort of intrinsic parts of cell identity, things that are hardwired into the cell. And what I mean by that is that hep hepatocyte, for example, has very different um, metabolism than, say, for example, um, a neuron or a hematopoietic stem cell. And this metabolic profile can often be geared towards a given cell type function. Um, and this leads to sort of an, an obvious question I, I think is really interesting. To proliferate, all of these cells need basically the same things, proteins, nucleotides, lipids, ATP. But these different cells have different metabolic profiles, and they can solve the problem of growth differently. And I think this implies that these networks can be wired in many different ways to meet the same metabolic demands. And so we're interested really in what the wiring strategies are that different cell types use. And one of the questions that we ask around the lab is to, is to find ways to generate unbiased views of possible ways to solve this problem of growth. And today I'm going to talk to you about one of the ways we've been doing that, which is by using, utilizing a resource out of the Broad Institute called DebMap. And so what DebMap is, is, um, is a resource where the Broad has performed CRISPR screens in 800 over 1,000 cancer cell lines now, actually. And what this allows you to do is generate a quantitative view of how each gene supports growth in each cell line. So you can do you can drive a metric essentially of how much any given cell line depends on any specific gene, really how essential that given gene is. And so what I'm showing you here is just uh, genes corresponding to the tricarboxylic acid or TCA cycle, and so this really central metabolic hub. And I'm plotting the degree to which each of these 800 or so cancer cell lines requires each gene. And you can see that there's a lot of a lot of data here. What you can see is that some genes are uniformly essential or non-essential. Um, but for many of these genes, there's actually quite a large spread. There's really heterogeneity and gene essentiality, even for this core metabolic pathway. And we find this really interesting. And you can imagine, and, and many other people are doing this, you can look at lineage-specific gene essentiality. You can separate out all of PDAC lines, all leukemia lines, and look to see which genes are required by specific lineages. But this variability has a lot of additional information we can harness as well. And that's because of really observations by, by us in the field that if two genes work together in the same pathway, they have highly correlated patterns of essentiality across cell lines. And I'll show you an example of that here. So what I'm plotting here is two subunits of the succinate dehydrogenous complex or complex two of the ETC. And what you can do is when you plot the essentiality of SDHV versus SDHC, um, these genes are highly correlated. And this makes sense, I think, intuitively. These genes work together in the same complex. And a cancer cell line that cares a lot about loss of SDHD is probably likely to care about SDHC as well. Um, and what's useful about this really is that you can predict gene modules from highly correlated genes. Two genes with the same um, co-essentially profile um, can work in the same gene module. Um, we're not by no means the first to show this. Others have done this as well. Um, and what this really, and this, this, these interactions are so strong to the extent they've been used to really infer the function of previously uncharacterized genes just by using these co-essentiality profiles. And so sort of the general steps of this analysis really are to identify a, a list or a gene or genes of interest perform pairwise correlation um, between these genes and generate a correlation matrix. And I'll show you some of that data here. So we performed this analysis for four sort of central metabolic processes, corresponding to the go terms I'm illustrated at the top of the screen, really one carbon metabolism, fatty acyl metabolism, glycolysis, um, and the TCA cycle. And sort of, I'm showing you this, this very large um, correlation matrix here. And by and large, you may notice there's a lot of white. These genes are by and large uncorrelated. And we hypothesize this perhaps reflects the plasticity of cancer cell lines and culture. But what is interesting is that some clusters do emerge here in the bottom left. You can see there's a TCA cycle cluster. So you can do to the right, you have a nice cluster corresponding to glycolytic genes cluster corresponding to one common metabolism. But then, so really surprisingly, another larger TTA cycle cluster up here. Uh, and this was surprising to us. Why would the TTA cycle sort of this core metabolic hub delineated by Hans Krebs back in the 1940s, why would that be split into two clusters in our analysis? Um, and so the other way you can represent this data is sort of in these 2D network diagrams that we like a lot. Um, and here, each circle really represents the gene, and the lines between each of these circles represent the strength of the correlations between those genes. And um, in that two genes that are more highly correlated will be closer together 
um, in this diagram. And you can see, once again, we see the emergence of clusters. You have a glycolysis cluster up here, you have one carbon cluster over here. But once again, the TPA cycle is split into two clusters. Um, and this is actually, this, and this was quite surprising to us, so we're interested specifically in what genes might be contained in each of these different TCA cycle clusters. Um, and so when we map these genes sort of onto a core metabolic pathways, what we quickly realized is that one cluster, the cluster I'm highlighting here, had genes involved in sequential oxidation of mitochondrial citrate. What I mean by that is that this cluster contained all the genes downstream of citrate sort of in the TCS cycle in by, by Krebs. So citrate can be processed by cognitase 2, and then down sort of through the rest of this bottom half of the chronological TCA cycle. But when we looked at the other cluster, what we, we realized was that these, this cluster involved genes in the, uh, that were involved in the production of citrate. Um, so shown here, um, the genes that were upstream of citrate. Um, so we're curious, why would the production of citrate really be uncoupled from its oxidation in the traditional TPA cycle? One clue really came when we mapped some of these other genes that clustered with the second TCA cycle cluster. And what we realized is that if you map all of these sort of Onto, onto metabolic pathways. What these genes really do is form uh, a cycle that's capable of continuous citrate regeneration. What I mean by that is that citrate, instead of being processed by ACO2, it's been shown that citrate can be exported from the mitochondria by the citrate mallet antiporter, SLC25A1, where it can then be cleaved by ACLY in the cytoplasm. And this has actually been shown before in really nice work by Katie Wallen and her group, that this, the cleavage of citrate by ACLY in the cytoplasm is important to generate the acetyl CoA necessary for lipid synthesis and histone acetylation. What's been what hasn't been appreciated previously in the field is that the acetyl acetate generated from this reaction can convert can be converted back to malate in the cytosol and eventually re-imported through the same citrate malate antiporter SLC 25A1. And that sort of complete what we call this non-canonical TCA cycle. So I can show you this, um, this sort of in silico analysis, we, and we found it quite striking, but we really wanted to, to test a way to test if this, what we call this non-canonical TCA cycle was really happening um, in, in cells. And so this is the work that was really led by a former graduate in the lab, Paige Arnold. And what Paige realized is that one way we can monitor flux through this canonical or non-canonical TCA cycle was actually to trace 13C labeled glucose. And so 13C labeled glucose shown here, in the cell is converted to M plus two labeled citrate. And, and what we realized is that if the citrate is processed by contase two in the canonical TCA cycle, we will actually see retention of these two labeled carbons and that you'll, you'll, which you can measure really as this malate, labeled malate M plus two shown here. Um, however, if this citrate is processed by AC, is exported into the cytosol and processed by ACL, these two carbons are liberated by these ACL reaction and actually for, and to, in the form of acetyl-CoA. And so you would see a loss of this citrate M plus two labeled downstream using the malate M plus zero instead. So you can read out engagement of this non-canonical TCA cycle really by looking at loss of the citrate M plus two label. And so we queried public data sets that have, that have done for this certain see glucose tracing. And we were really excited to see that in fact, you do see, this is just a non smong cell can a lung cancer cell line out of Ralph Gardinus's lab, you do see this drop off from citrate um, to downstream fumarate and malate. Um, the other way we can sort of represent this data by looking at the ratio of malate plus two to citrate plus two. So you can imagine that if uh, this if cells, if um, citrate is processed in the canonical TCA cycle, this ratio would increase um, versus uh, any sort of flux through ACL would result in a decrease in this malate plus two to citrate plus two ratio. And really nicely, we see that this, if you have a basal level of this, uh, this ratio sort of in these cancer cell lines that we queried, and then if you inhibit ACL, if you sort of block flux with this non-canonical TCA cycle, now you see an increase in this malate plus two over chichit plus two rate. So these cells having lost the ability to use ACL and are forced to flux through uh, ACO2. Um, and so this, this data was quite striking and then Paige did a lot of beautiful work elucidating this was not true just in cancer cells, but also in sort of primary cells. Um, but the question I think many of you may, may, be, may be asking, the one we asked ourselves was, why didn't Krebs see this? I and mean, the Krebs cycle has been delineated many years ago, um, but why did Krebs not observe sort of this, this um, why did he observe this pathway of citrate oxidation rather than the non-canonical TCA cycle? And so we looked back at the old literature um, uh, that, uh, and what we realized quickly is that Krebs did most of his original sort of work elucidating the canonical TCA cycle in pigeon breast muscle, sort of the tissue that he just sort of had around at the time. Um, and so we wondered if the fact that he had seen this canonical TCA cycle might correspond actually to the type of tissue he had been using. And so we took advantage of a myoblast differentiation system 
Um, these are mouse myoblasts. They can be differentiated from sort of the tight proliferative myoblasts to these um, myotube state. And when we do this sort of differentiation and monitor the incorporation of citrate and to down, of glucose into downstream from the test tablets, we can once again plot the malate plus two over citrate plus two ratio. And we see really nicely is that in these um, proliferative myoblasts, we see a really low malate plus two to citrate plus two ratio, indicative of use of this non-canonical TCA cycle. But as the cells differentiate to become these myotubes, we see a dramatic increase really in the ratio indicating use of the canonical TCA cycle, which is actually perfectly in line with what Krebs saw. So if TCA cycle wiring really changes the cell state, which is what we think this data indicates. We, we wondered if these, these changes were really required for effective fate determination. And here I'm gonna go back to a system that Natalia introduced earlier, and this is really embryonic stem cells. This is a really powerful system that we like in the lab um, because of the ability to model cell fate transitions and really study metabolism um, in a really powerful way. And so embryonic stem cells can really be cultured in sort of a metastable condition with serum and leukemia inhibitory factor. But it's been shown that if you in, in, add 2 i if you add inhibitors against GLK3 beta and MEK, and MEK what this really uh, allows you to do is convert the cells to this naive brown state of pluripotency where they're thought to be reminiscent of the uh, E3.5 implantation epiblast. Correspondingly, then, if you take this naive ESCs and withdraw 2 i and lift, they now begin to differentiate and sort of in a very short period of time in a very um, orchestrated fashion, they dismantle the pluripotency networks and begin to acquire differentiation competence. And some example of that is just shown here, where when we draw to I and lift for set periods of time, we see a down regulation of pluripotency transcription factors like nanog, BSRB, and a corresponding increase in some of these um, more differentiated markers shown here. Um, this, and these changes are functional as well. So if you return these cells that would have had to I and lift withdrawn uh, and look at assay their ability to form naive colonies, really you dramatically lose this quite early on with the extent that after 40 hours, very few of these cells are really able to form these naive colonies indicating that they have left the naive pluripotent state. So we utilize the system to once again, look at TC cycle configuration. And what we saw quite nicely was that the naive cells actually looked a lot like the myotubes we had observed. They had a really high malate plus two or citrate plus two ratio indicative of use of this canonical TCA cycle. Well, when you withdraw to I and lift, uh, you can see a decrease in this ratio indicating that as the cells differentiate, they begin to rely more on this non-canonical TCA cycle that's really anchored by ACL. So given that the cycle is, as I just said, anchored by ACL, we wondered what the effect of loss of ACL would be sort of on this. Um, and so we generated uh, um, ESC lines, that uh, clonal ESC lines that, with uh, ACL deletion. Um, and we saw quite nicely when we cultured these cells in the naive state, they really didn't have much of a phenotype. Um, as expected, loss of ACL had no effect sort of on malate plus two over citrate plus two um, labeling um, in the naive state. Um, and there really was no real uh, consistent effect on downstream TCA cycle pools. Things were by and large unchanged. And sort of alongside these metabolic, lack of metabolic phenotypes, we also didn't really, these cells seemed to be just fine. Um, they had no defects of proliferation, viability, they, they, uh, or protein synthesis, really. Um, however, when we withdraw 2i and lift from these cells, it's just that they begin to utilize this non canonical TCA cycle. Now we sort of begin to see dramatic metabolic phenotypes. Um, you can see that these cells now are unable to decrease their malate plus 2 or Richard plus 2 ratios. This value is now high because they cannot flex um, through ACL. And corresponding to this, they also have um, dramatically depleted levels of these downstream TCA cycle metabolites. Um, correspondingly, these cells fail to proliferate. Um, they essentially begin to die on the plate. They have decreased viability and also have defects in protein synthesis. Um, so we wondered, uh, we wanted to query sort of what the pluripotent state of these cells was, and we do that in a couple of ways here. Um, so you can see is that um, we first using a reporter of naive pluripotency, this Rex1 reporter that's high in the naive state, and then decreases with withdrawal of 2i and lift. Um, you can see here that this reporter decreases in exit from pluripotency. But if you add an inhibitor of ACL specifically just during this time when you withdraw to and lift, the effect will trap these cells in the naive state. They're really unable to dis the cells that remain have not dismantled the pluripotency networks. And we see this at the RNA level as well, where these cells have higher levels of the naive transcription factors and uh, decreased levels of, of SOX1. But also uh, these changes really are functional as well. If you take these cells and then look at their ability to form naive colonies, these ACL deficient ESCs now 
um, retain the ability to form these naive colonies even with after two I and F withdrawal, indicating they really are functionally trapped in this naive state. So I've talked to you at great length about this transition here, the, uh, when this uh, sort of exit from naive pluripotency that's really anchored by ACL. But the other sort of transition we've been interested in the lab is really the conversion of these metastable EOCs to this naive ground state of pluripotency. And sort of analogous to how ACLs are required for this conversion here, ACO2 we reason should be really required for the conversion to naive ground state, given that these EOCs, these naive ones, um, really seem to rely on this canonical TCA cycle. And so in parallel to these experiments I showed before, we generated clonal lines that were um, knocked out for ACO2. Um, and so you can see here, the sort of in serumless conditions, there's no real defect in proliferation in these cells, um, which, is, which was um, sort of nice to see. But when we convert these cells from naive ground state, when we add these inhibitors, these two I inhibitors, now we begin to see that these cells have defective proliferation. And this defective proliferation really is accompanied by by, by um, pluripotency, by transcriptional changes as well, that these cells are really now unable to efficiently upregulate expression of these core pluripotency genes, ACO2 cells relative to control counterparts have trouble upregulating um, levels of these transcripts. Um, so this I think emphasizes really that there are really cell state metabolic dependencies of these CSCs that really correspond to their different pluripotent identities. Um, but what does this really have to do with development? Um, so our embryonic stem cells, as I mentioned, are derived from the late blastocyst, but development exists on a spectrum really with, with many earlier embryonic cell states. Um, and development, I think, is really, is really quite remarkable. A cell, these cells, you know, going from the zygote to blastocyst stage have to really balance massive proliferation and cell division, um, all while sort of maintaining their cellular organization and a pluripotent cell fate. And so this makes sense that we think that this would require some sort of specialized metabolism. And I think work from our lab and others, including work that I've talked about today, has really, has really shown that specific metabolic programs can mark different states of development, both things like intracellular metabolic rewiring, uh, TPA cycle configuration, but also really nutrient acquisition programs. And these changes that I would like to emphasize don't happen in isolation, but for sure in the sort of nutrient metabolic milieu in which these cells find themselves. And so what we as a lab are really interested in is the way that these different, these specific metabolic programs can then create state dependent metabolic dependencies. We can exploit to either block or promote the differentiation of specific cell types and lineages. And with that, I'll just conclude by um, thanking my lab, especially Lydia for all her mentorship and this work, as well as my, my co-author on this um, page as well. I'm happy to take any questions. Very nice, thank you, Ben. Um, you have already one question from Anirud. Great work. Where in evolution did the TCA cycle uncouple? Is it a phenomenon observed across prokaryotes and metazoans? That's a really interesting question. We love thinking about those questions in the lab as well. Um, I, I don't have a, a short answer or a great answer for you here. What I will say is that um, there are more archaic TCA cycles that are found in bacteria, um, or, and even reverse TCA cycles that can sort of move in the other direction. Um, I ha I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to direct you um, to a review that will be coming out from our lab in the future, co-authored by Paige, that will sort of begin to tackle, will begin to address some of these questions, really. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating question that we think a lot about, and we're interested really in the evolutionary ways that these pathways are rewired as well. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you the same question as I asked Hannah, actually. Did you try? So are any of the two enzymes sufficient? So if you misexpress, so if you overexpress them rather than um, remove them, what ha does anything happen? Do you recapitulate any features of the, of the transitions there? Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, we have we haven't tested either of the two enzymes that I mentioned. We have had some um, interesting results with overexpressing the transporter SLC twenty five A one, and showing that that at least in part can sort of um, increase some flux through this non canonical TTA cycle. Um, but I think those are um, those are interesting questions as well. We think that really that the cycle is probably regulated at many nodes, and um, expression just of these these core genes might be might be one way. But you can imagine there are other ways that fluxes might be controlled as well. And we have one last question from Clara Lefranc. Can these differences between cell between different cell types and those variations of metabolism along cell differentiation help target cancer cells without harming the host cells? So do you see therapeutic potential in this basically? Yeah, yeah that's a, I think a really interesting um, a really interesting question. Um, that's definitely something that's of interest to the field. Um, in terms of the work we did here, we we are continuing to follow up on this. Um, 
uh, on, on this sort of work in, in many cancer systems as well. Um, and we hope to have more answers answers shortly. Yeah, but that's, I think, a really a really goal, not just of our lab, but I think of the field in general. Okay, great. So we're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, I'd like to, um, you can stop sharing your slides, actually. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, all three speakers for very interesting talks. And, and I guess last but not least, I'd like to encourage all of you to submit to a special issue. That, that meant for submission is um, 15th of May, uh, 2023. And, and thank you all, really, for attending and contributing interesting questions.